are listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. In one-sixth gravity, everything would weigh one-sixth, or 16.7% of its earth weight. In other words, a 180-pound man would weigh a mere 30 pounds. Think about this, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm going to strip away some of the bullshit that NASA's been shoving down your throats for years. Writers were speculating on the athletic abilities of men on the moon a long time before the space program and Apollo. They based their calculations on one-sixth gravity, because that's what the scientists told us the gravity on the moon would be. And the public was anticipating some of these spectacular athletic feats when astronauts explored the moon. Do you remember seeing any? None were ever performed, ladies and gentlemen. There just weren't any. And you say, well, they were weighted down with these big, giant, heavy suits. Mm-hmm. I got a bridge. You want to buy it? You may remember the televised pictures of astronauts moving around on the moon's surface. If so, we challenge you to recall any extraordinary feats at all. Because in all actuality, ladies and gentlemen, there were absolutely none. Zero. Zilch. Zip. Nothing. In the November 1967 issue of Science Digest, an article appeared by James R. Berry entitled, How to Walk on the Moon. In it, Mr. Berry predicted that men would be able to make 14-foot slow-motion leaps, perform backflips, and other gymnastics just like professionals and be able to easily move up ladders and poles with their arms, not even having to use their feet. Another prediction was given in 1969 by the writers of U.S. News and World Report in an article entitled, U.S. on the Moon, Look It Up. And they said, with gravity on the moon only one-sixth as strong as it is on Earth, a home run hitter in a lunar baseball game could drive a ball well over half a mile. A golfer's drive from the tee would sail clear over the horizon out of sight you wouldn't be able to see where it landed uh, even if you wanted to see the height an object will rise in a gravitational field ladies and gentlemen depends upon its initial velocity and if an object had the same initial velocity in one-sixth gravity as it had on earth it would rise six times as high if the initial velocity of the object were doubled over its Earth velocity, it would rise 24 times as high. And if tripled, it would rise 54 times the Earth height. Imagine, imagine the golf tournaments in such an atmosphere. A man jumps vertically by bending his knees and then flexing his thigh muscles to full extension try it yourself right where you are get the feel of this so you'll know exactly what we're talking about you see when he does this it propels him off the ground with a given initial velocity that can be measured and if an astronaut were to jump vertically in one-sixth gravity with the very same effort expended on earth the initial velocity would be greater than on Earth, therefore the astronaut would go more than six times higher. And we haven't even gotten to these suits yet, so don't get ahead of me. We're going to cover that, folks, using NASA's own figures. You see, for the purposes of this broadcast, a conservative approach is taken, and I always do that, with anything that we talk about, simply because I know that the wolves are out there ready to jump. We take a conservative approach in determining the relative jumping ability of astronauts in one-sixth gravity versus Earth gravity. A complicating factor, folks, is the alleged weight of the spacesuits and backpacks worn by the astronauts. Now here's where the fun begins. You see, NASA claimed, NASA claimed it's their own figures. I didn't make this up, and you can check yourself. NASA claimed 
that the gear weighed 185 pounds. Let me repeat that so that there's no misinterpretation. 185 pounds. Now this is a terribly oppressive weight to carry on the earth. But folks, it would be no problem whatsoever in one-sixth gravity. That is assuming that, that the astronauts weighed 185 pounds and their gear weighed the same. And these are the NASA figures and the astronauts, all of them, weighed pretty close to that figure. The total combined weight, ladies and gentlemen, in one-sixth gravity would be only 62 pounds. Now just ruminate on that a little bit. If the astronaut weighed 185 pounds, and his entire suit, all of his gear, weighed another 185 pounds. The equivalent combined total weight in one-sixth gravity would be only 62 pounds. And I'm here to tell you I could do amazing things if I weighed 62 pounds anywhere. Anywhere at all. But we didn't see any of that, did we? You see, this is still only one-third of an astronaut's body earth weight without any gear. Are you beginning to understand? Therefore, the astronauts should have been able to jump vertically far higher than they could on earth without any burden. And you remember when they were tooling around in that little car and they were spinning their wheels and the dirt was flying up, making a rooster tail? Well, folks, that dirt didn't fly up very high, and it didn't stay up in the air. It came down really quick. And according to statistics, dust in a one-sixth gravity atmosphere. In fact, an atmosphere only 2% as dense as Earth's atmosphere. That dust should still be floating around somewhere, shouldn't it? But it didn't. How are we going to explain this? How does NASA explain it? Very simply, folks, they don't. They can't. They never could, and they never will. Quite a number of professional athletes, ladies and gentlemen, can jump over three feet off the ground when they are stretched out, such as in a basketball layup. These athletes are the exception. But an average man in good condition can easily manage 18 inches in a standing vertical jump. Try it in your living room. Try it right now. I don't care how much you weigh. If you can't reach 18 inches, there's something really seriously wrong. Like you might be permanently injured and trying to jump from a wheelchair. It can be assumed that the astronauts, ladies and gentlemen, were capable of attaining this on Earth with a moderate effort, especially considering the rigorous training and the physical condition which they were expected to maintain. And in fact, if they did not maintain that certain specific physical conditioning, they would not have been allowed to make their flight. Are you following? Clear! crystal crisp logic that only comes from the hour of the time and finally folks since John Young's vertical jumping during the Apollo 16 mission has been observed on film many times by all of you and by me the question of spacesuit mobility and height attained can be discussed because we've all seen it you can go down and rent videos from your local video rental store right now and watch it again. You can order videos from NASA. You can do all of these things. You see, a standing vertical jump of at least 18 inches on Earth can be accomplished by exerting an upward force of around 500 pounds by a 185-pound person. An equation can be derived which gives the relative heights attained by an astronaut in one-sixth gravity carrying a burden equal to his weight and the same astronaut on earth without a burden now it was assumed that in each case the upward forces were identical since a jump from a standing vertical position only requires the knees to bend slightly 
the spacesuits would not have hampered the astronauts appreciably. The televised pictures of John Young on the moon indicated that he was able to utilize his arms and legs for jumping in an essentially normal manner with very little, if any, restriction. Now, folks, this is where it gets very interesting. You see, the resulting ratio of relative jumping ability calculated turns out to be over four. Over four. Now this means that even with the astronaut gear, Young should have been able to jump over six feet off the ground if the moon had one-sixth of the Earth's gravity. Now let's be conservative. Let's say he should have been able to only jump three feet off the ground in one-sixth Earth's gravity. Did he? Not on your life. In actuality, his efforts lifted him at most, ladies and gentlemen, 18 inches off the ground. Observations indicated that Young made several attempts to jump as high as he could, but with no success in achieving a height of more than 18 inches. He is shown at the peak of one of his jumps, in one of the famous NASA photographs, and if you can obtain this photograph, you will note the position of the top of Young's helmet in relation to the flag. Now critics might claim that he wasn't really trying. Now if you were on the moon and you had a chance to make a record jump and you knew that you were being viewed on television by billions of people around the world, are you trying to tell me that you wouldn't really try? Really? Is that what you're trying to say? Do you expect me, William Cooper, to believe such blithering nonsense? Because I don't believe it for one second. I think Young was trying the very best that he possibly could. You might claim that he purposely kept his jumping efforts to a minimum. But if this were the case, ladies and gentlemen, a similar earth effort without a backpack and suit would have lifted him only five inches or so. And this was probably Young's last chance to demonstrate that the moon had a low surface gravity. Why on earth wouldn't he make a reasonable effort to impress the world by jumping at least three or four feet? Especially when the figures say he could have easily reached six feet off the ground in a one-sixth gravity. You see, a reasonable jump would have been conclusive proof that the moon had a low gravity and the risk of injury would have been minimal in low gravity conditions even with the backpack and suit. With the knowledge that the astronauts could only jump about 18 inches on the moon, and assuming that the gear weighed what NASA claimed, and assuming that they were really on the moon when they made this jump, which is quite an assumption based upon all the evidence that we've been able to gather here. Moon gravity is conservatively calculated to be at least 50% of Earth gravity. Now, if NASA overstated the true weight of the astronaut's gear, moon gravity would be appreciably higher. Evidence to follow, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to present it to you during this broadcast, suggests that the astronaut's gear weighed no more than about 75 pounds total. That's right, 75 pounds total. But even if it did weigh 185 pounds, as NASA says, we've already given you enough proof to show that NASA's been lying to us for a long, long time. The moon's gravity was calculated to be 71% of the Earth's based on the following assumptions, ladies and gentlemen, that John Young jumped 18 inches on the moon, his space suit and backpack weighed 75 pounds on Earth, and he could manage 18 inches on the Earth without any burden. Now, even if that's wrong, if his suit actually weighed 185 pounds, it would still say that the moon's gravity was at least 50% of Earth's, assuming that all of these other things are constant. 
A lot of writers, ladies and gentlemen, seem to give the impression that the moon suits worn by the Apollo 11 astronauts were extremely restrictive. Yet the following information take from We Reached the Moon by Wilford indicates that this was not necessarily the case and in any event observed actions of the astronauts during the filmed portions of their activities on the moon shows that they moved around easily. They did not tire under this supposedly great burden. They were able to take long excursions, conduct explorations, chip off moon rocks, plant flags, set up experiments and equipment, much of which was left on the moon. Wilford, you see, mentioned that Neil Armstrong found that he could move around easily in his bulky spacesuit and heavy backpack under a lunar gravity one-sixth of Earth's. The costume, according to NASA, weighed 185 Earth pounds and was flexible enough so that the wearer could walk, dig, climb, and even place instruments on the moon's surface. Wilford also indicated that the astronauts did not find walking and working on the moon as taxing as had been forecast and that they bounded about easily in what they called kangaroo hops. In all actuality looked no different than a kid skipping sideways along the street. The idea of one-sixth gravity folks presents a major problem in explaining how the astronauts really performed compared to how they should have performed. You see, the difficulty in jumping can in no way be attributed to spacesuit bulkiness. However, a substantial lunar gravity would create problems. And why would they lie about the gravity? And why would they continue to lie about it even unto this day if the gravity was not the one-sixth Earths as they have stated? Why lie? Why lie, ladies and gentlemen? Well, we don't really know unless they really didn't go to the moon. Or unless maybe they went to the moon, but the televised and photographed portions of what the astronauts supposedly did on the supposedly moon were not really on the moon, but were filmed somewhere else. And why would they do that? Well, no one really knows that answer either, unless maybe they couldn't really get to the moon. Or unless they were afraid that some catastrophe would happen and they did not want this to be seen by the American people. Although I don't know how they would have explained the disappearance of all the astronauts had such a thing really happened. Isn't this interesting? In view, ladies and gentlemen, of the information that I have presented thus far, it may come as no surprise to you that security control extended to the astronauts' conversations on the moon as well as to mission control. You see, the ability to delete and edit undesirable comments made by the astronauts could always be accomplished before transmission to the public. They claim there was a delay from the time Mission Control received the information until transmission to our television sets, but all of that could have been staged also. But let's assume that there really was a delay. Why not? <laughs> and we're assuming an awful lot of stuff here, all based upon the information that NASA has given us, most of which turns out not to stand in the face of logic or in the face of scientific evidence or in the face of their own figures. I wonder why. The following is a summary of information taken from the voyages of Apollo by Lewis, which points out the degree of control exercised over the Apollo mission activities. You see, he indicated that the astronauts' tasks were all carefully plotted out in advance. The explorers were expected to follow the plot as faithfully as actors in a play to stay on schedule. Every move was planned, timed, recorded, and every deviation from the plan had to be explained and justified. 
Ladies and gentlemen, virtually every event and movement was governed by the flight plan, a script as large as a telephone book. Now it seems to me that even the dialogue was carefully controlled, especially when the astronauts knew they were being filmed or recorded for television, and this proves out to be a fact. And it can be demonstrated when references to a hot mic are made by one of the astronauts. And you can also find that on the tapes. Apollo 12 was a more extensive mission than the first moon landing, whereas Armstrong and Aldrin spent only two and a half hours on the moon. Conrad and Bean would spend a total of more than seven hours venturing a half mile from the spacecraft, or so they said. When you examine the photographs, the horizon in every single picture is always exactly 100 meters from the camera. Now I have a degree in photography folks and I can tell you that that's absolutely true. 100 meters. Didn't matter if they were in hilly terrain, flat terrain, bumpy terrain, no terrain, the horizon was always 100 meters from the camera. Wherever the camera was, This mission was to involve many scientific experiments, including an aluminum foil solar wind collector. And we'll discuss that on another broadcast because that's very interesting also. So is the flag, which you can see flapping in a lunar breeze in one of the films. Amazing. In an atmosphere that's not supposed to exist, where there can be no wind the flag is flapping in the breeze. Evidently, somebody forgot to shut the studio door. The first Apollo 12 discrepancy of significance revealing a high lunar gravity occurred just after Conrad jumped the final three feet from the bottom of the ladder to the moon's surface, and I'm not going to tell you about that until after this break. Don't go away. Helicopters all over the place out here, folks. This south of town for the last several nights. Large maneuvers involving helicopters and troops on the ground and in the air. Right now there are three black helicopters on the ground at the St. John's Airport. Don't ask me what's going on because they don't tell me what their plans are or what they're doing. But I will tell you this. There is an ominous air. And we are always ready in Arizona. Continuing with our broadcast, this information that I'm going to give you was summarized from an account of the incident by Lewis. As Conrad stood on the lunar module landing pad, he stated that the last step may have been a small step for Neil but was a long one for him. He then stepped off the pad and mentioned that he could walk pretty well, but that he had to take it easy and watch what he was doing. As Conrad was scooping up the contingency sample, Bean warned him not to fall over since he appeared to be leaning forward too far. Now supposedly it would be difficult for him to get up in the moon suit if he fell over. Conrad then stated that he did not think Bean would be able to steam around as fast as he thought he could. Now folks, in this incident that I've just recounted to you, it seems that Conrad was commenting on the final three-foot jump since he referred to Neil Armstrong's jump down to the surface, not an intermediate step to the lowest rung on the ladder. You see, jumping from a three-foot height in one-sixth gravity would be like jumping from six inches on the earth. No big deal. Even with the heavy backpack life support systems on, the three-foot drop would have scarcely been felt by the astronauts. They should have been able to lower themselves down with their arm strength alone, and no difficulties whatsoever should have been encountered unless NASA is lying. 
When Conrad began to move around on the surface, he might have experienced weight problems. However, even with the alleged weight of the gear, the astronauts should have had no problems in standing up if they fell down in only one-sixth gravity. They would have been able to provide the necessary push to right themselves with the strength of probably only one arm given their physical conditioning. One arm alone, since their moon weight should have only been 60 pounds or so. This is no big feat for a kid in high school. The evidence, folks, presented does not support the condition of one-sixth gravity. It indicates one of two things. It indicates a lunar gravity close to that found on the Earth's surface, or it indicates that the astronauts were not on the moon. Either one of those conclusions, if true, proves that NASA has lied to the American people and the world for many years. A photo appeared in the December 12, 1969 issue of Life magazine, which showed Apollo 12 astronaut Alan Bean carrying a barbell-shaped package of instruments which allegedly weighed 190 Earth pounds. Now, the accompanying statement that it had a moon weight of only 30 pounds cannot be consistent with the photo, which shows, ladies and gentlemen, a noticeable bow in the one-inch steel bar. Now, let's say it wasn't steel. Let's say it was aluminum. But the barbell, the total weight which NASA says only weighed 30 pounds in the moon weight, even a one-inch aluminum bar would not bow like you see in that picture. What else could it have been? Balsa wood? I don't think so. The movie film of this event is even more revealing, ladies and gentlemen, as Bean carried the instrument package across what was said to be the lunar surface. The bar bent up and down, strained by the heavy burden on each end. It was also apparent that the instrument package was quite heavy from Bean's efforts and movements, something that could not have been if they were only in one-sixth Earth's gravity. Before the remaining Apollo missions are discussed, folks, it may be of some value to you to examine how the astronauts were given training to prepare them for their excursions on the moon. If a 185 pound astronaut carried a backpack life support system and spacesuit weighing 185 pounds, the combined total weight of astronaut and gear would be 370 pounds on Earth compared to 62 pounds in one-sixth gravity conditions. And remember, we're talking total weight. Therefore, an Earth simulation of one-sixth gravity would have to lighten the astronaut and his equipment to one-third of his normal Earth body weight. Any attempt to simulate one-sixth gravity on Earth would have to be made underwater or with a special contraption which actually helps to lighten the astronaut and his burden regardless of whether he's moving up or down. And both of these methods were employed by NASA. Both of them. However, in early 1964, ladies and gentlemen, space scientists discovered Oregon as a place to serve as a lunar workshop without using water or special devices. You see, astronauts were sent to the Bend, Oregon area to get their moon legs, so to speak. Walter Cunningham was the first to try out the moon suit, backpack, life support system, and certain tools which were to be used by Armstrong and Aldrin on the moon excursion. In the first test over lava rocks, Cunningham lost his balance and sprained his thumb, tearing small holes in the suit glove which caused it to lose pressure. Evidently a full simulation was attempted. If so, 
How could the NASA people rationalize the weight problem? Can you explain it? I can't. There's no way that the condition of one-sixth gravity could be reproduced in this manner. Even if the backpack were lightened considerably, the combined weight of a 185-pound astronaut and gear would be far more than three times the required lunar weight. If anything, the real purpose of the tests must have been to simulate a lunar gravity which is nearly the same as Earth's or to perform the experiments under the exact same conditions on the actual planet where this would be filmed which may have been the Earth. That these astronauts were able to maneuver around at all in the Bend, Oregon area with their gear on suggests to me and to quite a few other intelligent people that the gear weighed far less than 185 pounds. The ridiculousness, the absolute absurdity of the exercise makes the NASA cover-up extremely clear. Clear as crystal. Since the tests began in early 1963, it is apparent that the moon's high gravity was discovered at least as early as 1962, if that is the explanation. Or, they knew as early as 1962 that they would not ever reach the moon, or if they did, the actual moon events would not be filmed, but a play of moon events might have been filmed somewhere in the Arizona, Nevada, eastern Washington state, deserts possibly. You see, throughout the early Apollo missions, folks, an attempt was made to impress the public that the Apollo moon suits were extremely bulky and awkward. This would greatly inhibit the astronauts' mobility on the moon, causing the public to believe that the moon's gravity really was one-sixth Earth's, or to believe that what they were seeing was really taking place on the moon, if in fact it were not. Consequently, the astronauts would be effectively handicapped and incapable of impressive athletic feats. It is somewhat unbelievable from that from the time Cunningham tested out the best available spacesuit gear in 1964 until the first Apollo landing in 1969 that little improvement was made in the suits. You see, the public has always been told that the best equipment was provided for the astronauts. And I can assure you, and the record bears it out, that enough money was paid to develop the very best equipment possible. A little digging brought an interesting discovery to light. In Suiting Up for Space, written in 1971, Lloyd Mallon stated the following and I quote verbatim as a matter of fact Hamilton standard had already achieved a spacesuit with 93 percent of nude range before October 1968 let me say that again as a matter of fact Hamilton standard had already achieved a spacesuit with 93 percent of nude range before October 1968. Now folks, nude range means the mobility of the human body with no restrictive clothing whatsoever. Nude, in the nude. They had already achieved 93 percent mobility with a suit before October 1968 when they demonstrated it before the aerospace scientists and engineers attending the fifth annual meeting of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics held at Philadelphia Pennsylvania live demonstrations of the suit during the week-long meeting attracted wide interest and attention and I'm still quoting plus some disbelief it was hard for some of the onlookers to believe that so much mobility could be designed into an inflated spacesuit, but it was. 
for the advanced suit was developed to meet the greater mobility requirements of manned space missions to follow the Apollo moon landing program and would in fact be tested on the moon. Now, me and several others contend that if as early as 1968 this was the best piece of equipment available, NASA had the time and money to ensure that it would be used on every Apollo mission. And of course that was the goal. After all, billions of dollars were spent in sending men to the moon. It is only reasonable to make sure that once the men are there, they can perform their tasks in the best possible manner. If they were not used, then perhaps NASA wanted to continue to convince the public that the moon had a weak gravity. Or if the astronauts were encumbered, there would be less chance of a breach in the cover-up. The bulkiness and weight would be good excuses for anemic jumping and maneuvering attempts. However, what appeared to be stiff waists in the suits were shown to be a lie when they easily climbed into their lunar rover vehicle and sat down in the seats in the same position that you find yourself in a small compact car. However, it was just pointed out that the Apollo 16 astronauts had great flexibility with improved suits, yet they were still not capable of worthy jumping feats. And I ask you why. You see, the public was told that modifications were made to the space suits by the time of the later Apollo missions. In the July 1971 issue of National Geographic, in an article entitled The Climb Up Cone Crater, Alice J. Hall stated, and I quote, Apollo 15's lunar module will be able to stay on the moon 67 hours twice as long as Antares did. Improved suits will allow greater mobility as the spacemen go about their chores." End quote. Now you can compare the sizes of the Apollo 11 suits with the Apollo 16 suits and see that the latter suits were less bulky in appearance. Therefore astronauts in the Apollo 16 mission should not have had any trouble on the moon if one sixth gravity conditions existed. Hills should have been climbed with leaping bounds and great distances should have been covered in short time periods by the astronauts who, with their combined total body weight, equipment and suit weight, should have weighed no more than 62 pounds. It should have been as if they had been in recapture of their youth. But that's not what we saw. Before the ill-fated Apollo 13 mission, which never made a lunar landing, astronauts Lovell and Hayes practiced a traverse in Verde Valley within Prescott National Forest, Arizona. I used to live in the Verde Valley, well acquainted with the terrain, the type of soil and the rocks. This was to give them the experience they would need to reach Cone Crater on a ridge about 400 feet higher than the proposed landing site elevation. Again, I suggest to you that practices in Arizona would be totally useless if one-sixth gravity were to be encountered on the moon. What is this? Foolum day, or is this magic time? What were they about with this scam? Because that's exactly what it was. A scam. Their centers of gravity on the moon would be different from the Earth's simulations, and the Earth weights would be three or four times too high to reproduce lunar conditions. However, the practice sessions would certainly have been useful in simulating Earth gravity conditions. Do you understand what I'm telling you? If Cunningham's backpack and spacesuit had weighed 185 pounds, he would have become totally exhausted in just a couple of minutes. 
with a combined weight of 370 some odd pounds. But he was not. He was not. Incredibly, his 1964 simulations involved spacesuit pressure. This implies that he carried oxygen and some sort of cooling system, otherwise he would have quickly passed out from the heat exhaustion. And, as an ex-professional diver, I can tell you that's true. And all this evidence points to the conclusion that the life support systems and spacesuits were light enough for the astronauts to have performed in high lunar gravity conditions for extended periods of time because they did it with the same equipment in Earth gravity. With no problem. In addition, this was accomplished as early as 1964, ladies and gentlemen, and developmental efforts would have lightened the gear considerably by 1969, and indeed the evidence and the statements by NASA and others confirmed that this did indeed take place. The combined spacesuit and life support system weight was probably less than 75 pounds. That's what the evidence shows. Exotic light metals and the best known materials available to NASA would have assured this. Following the Apollo 13 mishap on the way to the moon, a 10-month delay was taken to re-engineer and modify the spacecraft before Apollo 14. This mission would be another attempt to reach the highland regions of Fra Mauro and the highlight of the trip was to be the 1.8 mile excursion to Cone Crater. Now problems arose because the trip was mostly uphill and the astronauts had to take turns with the modularized equipment transporter or what they called the MET, the MET. On their first EVA or moon excursion Lewis mentioned that Shepard and Mitchell moved around with dancing steps and kangaroo jumps. Unfortunately, it seems like the first excursion must have gotten the best of them because on the trip to Cone Crater, the explorers were huffing and puffing and their heart rates climbed. And they should have only had a combined weight, even if their suits did weigh 185 pounds in one-sixth Earth's gravity of only 62 pounds. What's going on here? The difficulties were attributed, NASA said, to their semi-rigid cumbersome suits and the heavy backpack life support systems which supposedly weighed 185 pounds on Earth. Somebody is lying. It's important for you, the listener, to understand that the combined weight of astronaut, spacesuit, and life support system could not have exceeded 62 pounds using NASA's own figures in one-sixth gravity, and this could hardly be considered a sizable fraction of their Earth weight. Yet NASA claims to this day that their figures are correct. For men who were moving with dancing steps and kangaroo jumps the day before, slight hills seemed to prevent a formidable challenge. Now, if the moon's weak gravity presented such an awesome challenge to astronauts in walking uphill, then perhaps the excellent physical condition which these men were supposed to be in was overrated. It was expected to hear comments by the astronauts on the ease of moving up hills and in traversing long distances with little effort and great speed. Fortunately, Apollo missions 15, 16, and 17 did not subject astronauts quite as much to the moon's hostile environment and tremendous overpowering one-sixth gravity. The lunar rover was to transport them most of the way to their destinations. And it didn't weigh much either. And yet when we saw it hit a bump, it did not fly way up into the air, and neither does the dust kicked up by the wheels of this amazing craft. Live long and prosper and may the force be with you.
Good night, folks, and God bless you all.